Hello and welcome back to my channel. Well, the subscribers have spoken. We are continuing on with book one of the Tamarera series, His Majesty's Dragon by Naomi Novik. And we continue with chapter two. The next morning, remember uh, Lawrence has spent all night with this new dragon, this uh, very special dragon that they've captured from this French frigate. And the dragon is now taken to Lawrence, Captain Lawrence as its new master. And Lawrence has handed over his captainship to his uh, kind of like second in command, his protege. So let's see what happens the next morning. The next morning, Lawrence woke when Temeraire proceeded to envelop himself in his cot, which turned round twice as he tried to climb down. Lawrence had to unhook it to disentangle him, and he burst out of the unwound fabric in hissing indignation. He had to be groomed and petted back into temper like an affronted cat. Then he at once was hungry again. Fortunately, it was not very early, and the hands had met with some luck fishing, and th so there were still eggs for his own breakfast, the hens being spared another day, and a 40-pound tunny for the dragons. That's a fish. Temeraire somehow managed to devour the entire thing, and then was too heavy to get back into his cot, so he simply dropped in a distended heap upon the floor and slept there. The rest of the first week passed similarly. Temeraire was asleep except when he was eating, and he ate and grew alarmingly. By the end of it, he was no longer staying below, because Lawrence had grown to fear that it would be impossible to get him out of the ship. He had already grown heavier than a cart horse, and longer from tip to tail than, than the launch, which is the boat they used to get to and from the ship. After consideration of his future growth, they decided to shift stores to leave the ship heavier forward and place him upon the deck towards the stern as a counterbalance. So this beast, this dragon, is becoming so large they need to shift around the whole weight distribution of the ship. The change was made just in time. Temeraire only barely managed to squeeze back out of the cabin with his wings furled tightly, and he grew another foot in diameter overnight by Mr. Pollitt's measures, Fortunately, when he lay astern, his bulk was not greatly in the way, and there he slept for the better part of each day, tail twitching occasionally, hardly stirring, even when the hands were forced to clamber over him to do their work. At night, Lawrence slept on the deck beside him, feeling it his place. As the weather held fair, it cost him no great pains. He was increasingly worried about food. The ox would have to be slaughtered in a day or so, with all the fishing they could do. At this rate of increase in his appetite, even if Temeraire proved willing to accept cured meat, he might exhaust their supplies before they reached shore. It would be very difficult, he felt, to put a dragon on short commons. I think that means rations. And in any case, it would put the crew on edge. Though Temeraire was harnessed and might be, in theory, tame, even in these days, a feral dragon, escaped from the breeding grounds, could and occasionally would eat a man if nothing more appetizing were offered and from the uneasy looks no one had forgotten. When the first change in the air came, midway through the second week, Lawrence felt the alteration unconsciously and woke near dawn, some hours before the rain began to fall. The lights of the Amite were nowhere to be seen. The ships had drawn apart during the night, under the increasing wind. The sky grew only a little lighter, and presently the first thick drops began to patter against the sails. Lawrence knew that he could do nothing. Riley must command now, if ever, and so Lawrence set himself to keep to keeping Temeraire quiet and no distraction to the men. This proved difficult, for the dragon was very curious about the rain and kept spreading his wings to feel the water beating on them. It's kind of cool thinking of a dragon being newborn, never having experienced rain before, he wants to see what's going on. Thunder did not frighten him, nor lightning. What makes it? he only asked, and was disappointed when Lawrence could offer him no answer. We could go and see, he suggested, partly unfolding... Oh, sorry, this is uh, Tamaraire. We could go and see, he suggested, partly unfolding his wings again and taking a step towards the stern railing. Lawrence started with alarm. Tamaraire had made no further attempts to fly since the first day, being more preoccupied with eating. And though they had enlarged the harness three times, they had never exchanged the chain for a heavier one. So he could see the iron links straining and beginning to come open, though Temeraire was barely exerting any pull upon it. So this chain is not going to hold him in place. 
Not now, Tamarar. We must let the others work and, and watch from here, he said, gripping the nearest side strap of the harness and thrusting his left arm through it, though he realized now, too late, that his weight would no longer be an impediment. At least if they were, if, at least if they went aloft together, he might be able to persuade the dragon to come down eventually. Or he might fall. But that thought, uh, he pushed from his mind as quickly as it came. Thankfully, Tamarare settled again, if regrettably, and returned to watching the sky. Lawrence looked about with a faint idea of calling for a stronger chain, but the crew were all occupied, and he could not interrupt. In any case, he wondered if there were any on board that would serve as more than annoyance. He was abruptly aware that Tamarare's shoulder topped his head by nearly a foot, and that the foreleg, which had once been as delicate as a lady's wrist, was now thicker around than his thigh. Riley was shouting through the speaking trumpet to issue his orders. Lawrence did his best not to listen. He could not intervene, and it would only be unpleasant to hear an order he did not like. The men had already been through one nasty gale as a crew and knew their work. Fortunately, the wind was not contrary, so they might go scudding before the gale, and the topgallant masts had already been struck down properly. So far, all was well, and they were keeping roughly on their eastern heading. But beyond them, an opaque curtain of whirling rain blotted out the world, and it was outpacing the Reliant. The wall of water crashed upon the deck with the sound of gunfire, soaking him through to the skin immediately, despite his oilskin and sou'wester. Tamarare snorted and shook his head like a dog, sending water flying, and ducked down beneath his own hastily opened wings which he curled about himself. Lawrence, still tucked up against his side, holding to the harness, found himself also sheltered by the living dome of his wing. It was exceedingly strange to be so snug in the heart of a raging storm. He could still see out through the places where the wings did not overlap, and a cool spray came in upon his face. "'That man who brought me the shark is in the water,' Tamarare said presently and Lawrence followed his line of sight. Though the nearly sol through the nearly solid mass of rain, he could see a blur of red and white shirt some six points abaft the larboard beam, and something like an arm waving. Gordon, one of the hands who had been helping with the fishing. "'Man overboard!' he shouted, cupping his hands around his mouth to make it carry, and pointed out to the, pointed out to the struggling figure in the waves. Riley gave one anguished look. A few, a few ropes were thrown." But already the man was too far back. The storm was blowing them before it, and there was no chance of retrieving him with the boats. He is too far from the ropes, from these ropes, Tamarare said. I will go and get him. Lawrence was in the air and dangling before he could object, the broken chain swinging free from Tamarare's neck beside him. He seized it with his loose arm as it came close and wrapped, around the, wrapped it around the straps of the harness a few times to keep it from flailing and striking Tamarare's side like a whip. Then he clung grimly and tried only to keep his head while his legs hung out over the empty air with nothing but the ocean waiting below to receive him if he should lose his grip. Wow. Instinct had sufficed to get them aloft, but it might not be adequate to keep them there. Tamarare was being forced to the east of the ship. He kept trying to fight the wind head on. There was a hideous, dizzying moment where they were tumble when they went tumbling before a sharp gust, and Lawrence thought for an instant that they were lost and would be dashed into the waves. With the wind, he roared with every ounce of his breath, developed over eighteen years at sea, hoping Tamarare could hear him. Go with the wind, damn you! The muscles beneath his cheek strained, and Temeraire righted himself, turning eastwards. Probably the rain stopped. Abruptly, the rain stopped beating upon Lawrence's face. They were flying with the wind, going at an enormous rate. He gasped for breath, tears wiping away from his eyes with the speed. He had to close them. It was as far beyond standing in the tops at ten knots as that experience was beyond standing in a field on a hot, still day. There was a reckless laughter trying to bubble out of his throat like a boy's, and he could only and he only barely managed to stifle it and think sanely. We cannot come straight at him, he called. You must tack. You must go to north, then south, Temeraire. Do you understand? If the dragon answered, the wind took the reply, but he seemed to have grasped the idea. 
He dropped abruptly, angling northwards with his wings cupping the wind. Lawrence's stomach dived as, a, as on a rowboat in a heavy swell. The rain and wind still battered them, but not so badly as before, and Tamarare came about and changed tacks as sweetly as a fine cutter, zigzagging through the air and making gradual progress back in a westerly direction. Lawrence's arms were burning. He felt he thrust his left arm through the breast band and losing his grip, and oh, almost losing his grip, and unwound his right hand to give it a respite. As they drew even with and then past the ship, he could just see Gordon still struggling in the distance. Fortunately, the man could swim a little, and despite the fury of the rain and wind, the swell was not so great as to drag him under. Lawrence looked at Tamarare's claws dubiously, with the enormous talons. If the dragon were to snatch Gordon up, the maneuver might, easily, might as easily kill the man as save him. Lawrence would have to put himself into position to catch Gordon. Tamarare, I will pick him up. Wait until I am ready, then go as low as you can, he called. Then he lowered himself down the harness slowly and carefully to hang down from the belly, keeping one arm hooked through a strap at every stage. It was a terrifying progress, but once he was below, matters became easier, as Tamarare's body shielded him from the rain and the wind. He pulled on the broad strap which ran around Tamarare's middle. There was perhaps just enough give. One at a time, he worked his legs between the leather and Tamarare's body so he might have both his hands free, then strapped the dragon, uh, hands free, then strapped, then slapped the dragon's side. Tamarare stooped abruptly like a diving hawk. Lawrence let himself dangle down, trusting to the dragon's aim, and his fingers made furrows in the surface of the water for a couple of yards before they hit sodden cloth and flesh. He blindly clutched at the feel, and Gordon grabbed him and grabbed at him in turn. Tamarare was lifting back up and away, wings beating furiously, but thankfully they could go now with the wind with the wind instead of fighting it. Gordon's weight dragged on Lawrence's arms, shoulders, thighs, every muscle straining. The band was so tight upon his calves that he could no longer feel his legs below the knee, and he had the uncomfortable sensation of all the blood in his body rushing straight into his head. They swung heavily back and forth like a pendulum as Tamarare arrowed back towards the ship, and the world tilted crazily around him. They dropped onto the deck ungracefully, rocking the ship. Tamarare stood, waving on his hind legs, trying at the same time to fold his wings out of the wind and keep his balance with the two of them dragging him downwards from the belly strap. Gordon let go and climbed away in panic, leaving Lawrence to extract himself while Tamarare seemed about to fall over upon him at any moment. His stiff fingers refused to work on the buckles, and abruptly Wells was there with a knife flashing, cutting through the strap. His legs thumped heavily to the deck, blood rushing back into them. Temeraire similarly dropped down to all fours again beside him, the impact sending a tremor through the deck. Lawrence lay flat on his back and panted, for the moment not caring that rain was beating full upon him. His muscles would obey no command. Wells hesitated. Lawrence waved him back to his work and struggled back onto his legs. They held him up. The pain of the returning sensation eased as he forced them to move. If you ever had that when your legs lost feeling and you stood up and it kind of hurts as the blood comes back in? Yeah. The gale was still blowing around them, but the ship was now set to right, scudding before the wind under close reef topsails, and there was less of a feel of crisis upon the deck. Turning away from Riley's handiwork with a sense of mingled pride and regret, Lawrence coaxed Tamarare to shift back towards the center of the stern, where his weight would not unbalance the ship. It was barely in time. As soon as Tamarare settled down once again, he yawned enormously and tucked his head down beneath his wings, ready to sleep for once without making his usual demand for food. Lawrence slowly lowered himself to the deck and leaned against the dragon's side. His body still ached profoundly from the strain. He roused himself for only a moment longer, he felt the need to speak, though his tongue felt thick and stupid with fatigue. Tamara, he said, that was well done, very bravely done. Tamara brought his head out and gazed at him, eye slits widening to ovals. Oh, he said, sounding a little uncertain. 
Lawrence realized with a brief stab of guilt that he had scarcely given the dragon at a kind word before this. The convulsion of his life might be the creature's fault in some sense, but Temeraire was only obeying his nature, and to make the beast suffer for it was hardly noble. But he was too tired at the moment to make better amends than to repeat lamely, Very well done, and pat the smooth black side. Yet it seemed to serve. Temeraire said nothing more, but he shifted himself a little and tentatively curled up around Lawrence partly unfurling a wing to shield him from the rain. The fury of the storm was muffled beneath the canopy, and Lawrence could feel the great heartbeat against his cheek. Could you imagine? He was warmed through in moments by the steady heat of the dragon's body, and thus sheltered he slid abruptly and completely into sleep. "'Are you quite sure it is secure?' Riley asked anxiously. "'Sir, I'm sure we can put together a net. Perhaps you'd better not.' Lawrence shifted his weight and pulled against the ca pulled against the straps, wrapped snugly around his thighs and calves. They did not give, nor did the main part of the harness, and he remained stable in his perch atop Tamarare's back, just behind the wings. "'No, Tom, it won't do, and you know it. This is not a fishing boat, and you cannot spare the men. It might very well I we might very well meet a Frenchman one of these days, and then where will we be?' He leaned forward and patted Tamarare's neck. The dragon's head was doubled back, observing the proceedings with interest. "'Are you ready? May we go now?' he asked, putting a forehead on the railing. Muscles were already gathering beneath the smooth hide, and there was a palpable impatience in his voice. "'Stand clear, Tom,' Lauren said hastily, casting off the chain and taking hold of the neck strap. Very well, Tamarar, let us a single leap, and they were airborne, the broad wings thrusting in great sweeping arcs to either side of him, the whole long body stretched out like an arrow, driving upwards into the sky. He looked downward over Tamarar's shoulder. Already the Reliant was shrinking into a child's toy, bobbing lonely in the vast expanse of the ocean. He could even see the Amite, perhaps twenty miles to the east. The wind was enormous, but the straps were holding, and he was grinning idiotically again. He realized, unable to prevent himself. "'We will keep to the west, Tamarare,' Lawrence called. He did not want to run the risk of getting too close to land and possibly encountering a French patrol. I'm assuming a French patrol of dragons flying around you know, their borders. They had put a band around the narrow part of Tamarare's neck beneath the head and attached reins to this, so Lawrence might more easily get give Tamarare direction. Now he consulted the compass he had strapped into his palm and tugged on the right rein. The dragon pulled out of his climb and turned willingly, leveling out. The day was clear, without clouds, and a moderately and a moderate swell only. Tamarare's wings beat less rapidly now that they were no longer going up, but even so, the pace was devouring the miles. The Reliant and the Amite were already out of sight. "'Oh, I see one,' Temeraire said. They were plummeting down with even more speed. Lawrence gripped the reins tightly and swallowed a yell. It was absurd to feel so childish, childishly gleeful. I don't know about you. I mean, sure, this is an alternate fantasy world of history where dragons were always around, but I think for anyone that would just be incredible, right? Considering flight is... Up to, even up to this point, a very rare thing. The distance gave, uh, gave him some more idea of the dragon's eyesight. It would have to be prodigious to allow him to sight, a prey, it's, sight prey at such range. He had barely time for the thought, and then there was a tremendous splash, and Tamarare was lifting back away with a porpoise struggling in his claws and streaming water. Another astonishment, Tamarare stopped and hovered in place to eat, his wings beating perpendicular to his body and swiveling arcs. Lawrence had no idea that dragons could perform such a maneuver. It was not comfortable. It was not comfortable, as Tamarare's control was not very precise, and he bobbed up and down wildly. But it proved very practical, for as he scattered bits of entrails onto the ocean below, the other fish began to rise to the surface to feed on the discards. And when he had finished with the porpoise, he at once snatched up two large tunnies, one in each forehand, and ate these as well. Then an immense swordfish also. Having tucked his arm under the neck strap to keep himself from being flung about, Lawrence was free to look around himself and consider the sensation of being master of the entire ocean, for there was not another creature or vessel in sight. 
he could not help but feel pride in the success of the operation. And the thrill of flying was extraordinary. So long as he could enjoy it without thinking of all it was to cost him, he could be perfectly happy. Tamarare swallowed the last bite of the swordfish and discarded the sharp upper jaw after inspecting it curiously. I am full, he said, beating up backwards into the sky. Shall we go and fly some more? It was, <laughs> I don't know why I gave him a little moa. <laughs> it was a tempting sensation, but they had been aloft for more than an hour. Lawrence was not yet sure of Tamarare's endurance. He regretfully said, let us go back to the Reliant, and if you would like, we may fly a bit more after her. And then racing across the ocean, low to the waves now, with Tamarare snatching at them playfully every now and then, the spray misting his face and the world, world rushing by in a blur, but for the constant solid presence of the dragon beneath him. He gulped deep drafts of salt air and lost himself in simple enjoyment, only pausing every once and again to tug the reins after consulting his compass and bringing them at last back to the Reliant. Tamarare said he was ready for sleep again after all, so they made a landing. This time it was a more graceful affair, and the ship did not bounce uh, as much as settle slowly lower in the water. Slightly lower in the water. Lawrence unstrapped his legs and climbed down, surprising, surprised to find himself a little saddle sore. But he at once realized that it was only to be expected. Riley was hurrying back to meet them, relief written clearly on his face, and Lawrence nodded to him reassuringly. No need to worry. He did splendidly, and I think you need not worry about his meals in the future. We will manage very well, he said, stroking the dragon's side. Temeraire, already drowsing, opened one eye and made a pleased rumbling noise, and then closed it again. I'm very glad to hear it, Riley said, and not least because that means our dinner for you tonight will be respectable. We took the precaution of continuing our efforts in your absence, and we have a very fine turbot which may now keep our, which we may now keep for ourselves. With your consent, uh, perhaps I will invite some members of the gun room to join us. With all my heart, I look forward to it, Lawrence said, stretching to relieve the stiffness in his legs. He'd insisted on surrendering the main cabin once Temeraire had been shifted to the deck. Riley had at last acquiesced, but he compensated for his guilt by displacing his former ca of displacing his former captain by inviting Lawrence to dine with him virtually every night. This practice had been interrupted by the gale, but that having blown itself out the night before, they meant to resume this evening. It was a good meal, and a merry one, particularly once the bottle had gone around a few times, and the younger midshipmen had drunk enough to lose, uh, lose their wooden manners. Lawrence had the happy gift of easy conversation, and his table had always been a cheerful place for his officers. To help matters along further, he and Riley were fast approaching a true friendship now that the barrier of rank had been removed. The gathering thus had an almost informal flavor to it, so that when Carver found himself the only one at liberty, having devoured his pudding a little more quickly than his elders, he dared to address Lawrence directly, and tentatively said, Sir... If I may be so bold as to ask, is it true that dragons can breathe fire? Lawrence, pleasantly full of plum duff, topped by several glasses of a fine Riesling, that's a German wine, sweet wine, very good, received the question tolerantly. That depends upon the breed, Mr. Carver, he answered, putting down his glass. However, I think the ability extremely rare. I have only ever seen it once myself, in a Turkish dragon, at the Battle of the Nile and I was damn glad to see the, Turk the Turks had taken our part when I saw it work, I can tell you. The other officers shuddered all around and nodded. Few things were as deadly to a ship as uncontrolled fire upon her deck. I was on the Goliath myself, Lawrence went on. We were not half a mile distant from the Orient when she went up like a torch. We had shot her out of deck guns and mostly cleared her sharpshooters from the tops so the dragon could strafe her at will. He fell silent, remembering the sails all ablaze and trailing thick plumes of black smoke, the great orange and black beast diving down and pouring still more fire from its jaws upon them, its wings fanning the flames, the terrible roar which was only drowned out at last by the explosion, and all and the way all sound had been muted for nearly a day thereafter. He had been in Rome once as a boy, and, and there seen in the Vatican a painting of hell by Michelangelo, with dragons roasting the damned souls with fire. 
it had been very like. So you just see right there, anybody who's a history buff like myself, when you hear these these things, what the author, uh, Naomi Novik, has chosen to do is to keep history more or less intact. Yes, dragons are showing up in the story, but I think she's trying not to alter history too much as a result. So was there still a Michelangelo painting uh, famous works? In Was there still a Vatican, a Roman Catholic Church? Yes, in this world, most of these things are still the same, except you just see dragons woven woven into that historical culture as it's been described in history books. So now we instead in that Michelangelo painting, for example, it's a, there's dragons instead of, let's say, uh, just the standard default, I don't know, demons or skeletons or something like that. The Battle of the Nile is the name of a battle that happened during the Napoleonic War, but now there's dragons and stuff like that that might have been involved, as they would be if dragons were, you know, in this imaginary world, something that had been with humankind uh, the whole time. So I just like, again, how she does that, and that's a part of the book where that first sort of happens so so clearly, at least for, for me. All right, let's keep going. There was a general moment of silence, imagination drawing the scene for those who had not been present at, at that battle. Mr. Pollitt cleared his throat and said, Fortunately, I believe that the ability to spit poison is more common among them, or acid, not that those are the, not, uh, not that those are not formidable weapons in their own right. Lord, yes, well said to this. I've seen dragon spray eat away an entire mainsail in under a minute. But still, if it will not set fire to a magazine and make your ship burst into flinders under you. Will Temeraire be able to do that? Battersea asked, a little round-eyed at these stories. And Lawrence started. He was not sitting at Riley's right hand, just as it had been, just as if... He, oh, he was sitting at Riley's right hand, just as if he had been invited to the gun room for dinner, and for a moment he had almost forgotten that instead he was a guest in his former cabin and upon his former ship. Fortunately, Mr. Pollitt answered, so Lawrence could take a moment to cover his confusion. As his breed is not one of those described in my books, we must wait for the answer until we reach land and can have him properly identified, even if he is of the appropriate kind. Most likely there would be no manifestation of such an ability until he's had his full growth, which will not be for some months to come. Thank heavens, Riley said, to the general round of laughing agreement, and Lawrence managed to smile and raise a glass in Temeraire's honor with the rest of the table. Afterwards, having said his good nights in the cabin, Lawrence walked a little unsteadily back towards the stern, where Temeraire lay in solitary splendor, the crew having almost ab mostly abandoned that part of the deck to him as he had grown. He opened a gleaming eye as Lawrence approached and lifted a wing in invitation. Lawrence was a little surprised at the gesture, but he took up his pallet and ducked under into the comfortable warmth. He unrolled the pallet and sat down upon it, leaning back against the dragon's side, and Tamarare lowered the wing again, making a warm, sheltered space around him. "'Do you think I will be able to breathe fire or spit poison?' Temeraire asked. "'I'm not sure how I could tell. I tried, but I only blew air.' "'Did you hear us talking?' Lawrence asked, startled. The stern windows had been opened, and the conversation might as well might well have been audible on deck. But somehow it had not occurred to him that Temeraire might listen. "'Yes,' Temeraire said. "'The part about the battle was very exciting.' Have you been in so many of them? Oh, I suppose so, Lawrence said. Not more than many other fellows. This was not entirely true. He had an unusually large number of actions, that's battles, in his credit, which had, not, uh, which had seen him to the post list at a relatively young age, and he was accounted a fighting captain. But that is how we found you when you were in the egg. You were aboard the prize when we took her, he added, uh, indicating the Amite, her stern lanterns pres presently visible two points to the larboard. Temeraire looked out at her with interest. You won me? In a battle? I did not know that. He sounded pleased by the information. Will we be in another one soon? I would like to see. I'm sure I could help, even if I cannot breathe fire yet. Lawrence smiled at his enthusiasm. Dragons notoriously had a great deal of fighting spirit, part of what made them so valuable in war. Most likely not before we put into port, but I dare say we will see enough of them after. England does not have many dragons, so we will most likely be, we will most likely be called on a great deal once you are grown, he said. 
He looked up at Tamarare's head, presently raised up to gaze out to sea. Relieved of the pressing concern of feeding him, Lawrence could now could give thought now to the other, other meaning of all the strength behind his back. Tamarare was already larger than some full-grown dragons of other breeds, and in his inexperienced judgment, very fast. He would indeed be invaluable to the Corps and to England, fire breath or no. It was not without pride that he thought to himself there was no fear Tamarare would ever prove shy. If he had a difficult duty ahead of him, he could hardly have asked for a worthier partner. "'Will you tell me some more of the Battle of the Nile?' Tamarare sa uh, said, looking down. "'Was it just your ship, and the other one, and the dragon?' "'Lord, no. There were thirteen ships of the line for our side, "'with eight dragons from the Third Division of the Aerial Corps in support, "'and another four dragons from the Turks,' Lawrence said. "'The French had seventeen and fourteen to, for their part, so we were outnumbered.' But Admiral Nelson's strategy left them wholly taken aback. Now, again, Admiral Nelson, you know, Horatio, Lord Horatio Nelson, famous British war hero from the Napoleonic era, still very much in the story. So just reinforcing again uh, what I loved about this was what I felt was a pretty faithful historical sort of fiction book with a really awesome streak of fantasy in it. Left them wholly taken aback, as he continued. Tamarare lowered his head and curled more closely about him, listening with his great eyes shining in the darkness. And so they talked quietly together long into the night. Cool chapter. Really starts to suck you into the book and the relationship. Oh my gosh, uh, this reliance between this dragon and a human and what could happen when it's all drawn up into this huge global conflict that it's set in, uh, in the back of. Very interesting stuff. Thanks for the uh, subscribers uh, for um, encouraging me to continue on with the book. Pretty excited to... to take it all the way through. I know some people have already read the book, but it's nice to have it uh, uh, read to you uh, this time or to, to your children. Um, welcome to have that. So please subscribe and you'll get uh, instant alerts. You won't miss, a, uh, won't miss a chapter as it comes out. Thanks so much and we'll see you on the next one.